and welcome to today's webinar, Optimizing Performance. My name is Roy Sarkar and I'll be your host for today. This is the fourth in a series of webinars developed by our PHP experts to bring you the knowledge, tips, and tools necessary to build apps ready for the enterprise. First, a few housekeeping items. All attendees are muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have a question, you can use the question and answer tool on the right side of your screen and we'll answer them throughout the broadcast via our panel of experts. Also note that today's presentation is being recorded and will be available online following the webcast. We will also provide a slide on slide share. Now I'd like to introduce our special presenter, Zev Sarafi, CTO and VP of Engineering at Rogue Wave Software, leading the Zen research and development teams. Zev is one of the principal authors of the PHP programming language and has been involved with PHP dating back to 1997 when he co-created the foundation for PHP 3, the first version of PHP that resembles today's modern PHP. Zev later spearheaded the PHP 4 project, which made PHP the most popular development language in the world for web apps, contributed to PHP 5, and is to blame for the sixth version of PHP named PHP 7. Take it away, Zev. Thanks, Roy. So uh, I'd like to continue for a few more bullets on myself, but some kind of less lesser known things about me. So first of all, I have three daughters, which uh, gives me an awesome excuse to do things like this and that. And every once in a while, I also let them uh, play with the elephants. I'm a photography enthusiast. I'm downright crazy about spicy foods. I'm, I've been developing since the age of 12, or as they call it, called it back in the day, programming. And the last thing I did before getting involved with PHP was uh, C++ CGI's and just say no to those. I hope there's nobody in the audience that uh, ever did it, uh, because it's really not a very good idea at all. So, first of all, recapping on our definition of what is enterprise PHP, the same definition that we spoke about in the previous webinars. So, in our mind, enterprise PHP uh, means apps which are built securely on top of a secure stack and deliver optimal performance and are easily scalable. On one hand, they are always on, they cannot go down, and on the other hand, they also are updated very frequently to meet release timelines and changing business requirements. Um, a very common use case for um, uh, enterprise PHP is modernization of existing business logic. So if you have uh, in your company business logic from several years ago, or even sometimes several decades ago, and you want to uh, modernize it and connect it to the modern web, you can simply web enable, uh, create a layer around it and web, web enable it. And finally, there absolutely needs to be a clear support path uh, something that supports your production needs, your business critical needs, and providing you with long-term support so that you can upgrade on your own terms. At the bottom here, you can see really a tiny sample of some of the very large enterprises around the world that are using PHP, but again, of course, this is just a, um, a very small sample out of really hundreds of companies in the Fortune 1000 that are using PHP. So, as I mentioned, uh, I'd like to talk to you today about performance, and uh, first of all, I want to uh, create a definition that we can agree on, uh, so that we all know that we're talking about the same thing, and as I, as I was researching for this uh, webinar, I was looking for uh, a definition, and I actually found a lot of different definitions. It was surprisingly difficult to find something that I liked, and I didn't really find something that was really, that really clicked with me. So I ended up taking uh, a definition, then massaging it a bit to, uh, to, to fit my needs, and that's what I came up with. So the effectiveness of a computer system is measured by a git upon criteria, such as throughput, response time, and availability. Now, <clears throat> before we dive into um, how we deal and manage performance, um, I think it's important to establish that performance is important. And even though I'm, I'm sure that many, if not all of you in the audience, uh, already believe that, here are some uh, data points that illustrate just how important it is. So among Fortune 1000 companies, the cost of an hour of uh, downtime is typically between half a million and a million dollars. This is not an insignificant number. When you factor into account that uh, in most cases it takes more than one hour to recover from such an application downtime, and in a quarter of the cases it takes more than 12 hours, those numbers really add up very, very quickly. And if you summarize the whole thing, then the cost of, uh, average cost of downtime uh, in Fortune 1000 companies 
averages between $125 million to a quarter of a billion dollars every year. This is a very substantial number, and obviously, the more you can do to mitigate it, the better. So that was about availability, but speed is always a major role in your uh, business success. So according to Akamai, a single second of delay in page response can result in a 7% reduction in conversion. That's, again, a very substantial number. Just one second of extra response time um, that the user has to wait can reduce your conversion rates and your business results quite substantially. So another hopefully uh, established why performance is important, um, let's talk a bit about what can influence it. And the somewhat unfortunate reality is that really almost anything can influence it. Hardware can obviously influence it. If you have a fast modern machine, uh, in all likelihood it's going, to be, uh, it's going to perform faster than an old machine with you know, maybe just one or two cores. Um, network bandwidth. Obviously, when we're talking about network-connected uh, applications, such as web-based applications, network bandwidth can also play a role. Application complexity, this is a, a big one. The more uh, complex and the more sophisticated um, your app is, in all likelihood, the more time it's going to consume when it executes. Memory consumption can influence uh, performance in, uh, in, in different ways. Generally speaking, the more memory your app consumes, the, the slower it is. Um, moving memory around is a relatively slow process for computers, uh, and the more memory your application needs to move around as it executes, uh, the slower it typically is. And it also factors in to the amount of, to the level of concurrency that you can uh, reach from your server, because the more memory um, uh, your application consumes, the fewer in concurrent instances you can run on a given server with a finite amount of memory. So memory consumption is also quite important. The response time of, um, of external resources like databases and service providers also plays a role. Uh, your app could be optimized, your web server could be you know, very, very fast, but if you have a very slow database that is overloaded and you need to wait for it, then the overall performance is going to be slow. User load can obviously influence performance. You could have a server that performs just fine um, when it has just a handful of people using it, but if you have um, thousands of people using it at the same time, it may crumble under the load and become very, very slow for a variety of reasons, both obvious and less obvious ones, but definitely if you have a, a not very popular application, uh, it's not as important to worry about performance compared to if you have a very popular application. And finally, and somewhat uh, very related to the user load, time of day uh, can, can actually play a major role in the performance of an application. Um, for instance, if you have an application, if you have a, web, a website that is pointed to by a TV show, a commercial, uh, um, or something of the sort, or if you have a website that is related to something seasonal or specifically related to the day of the week, like you know, uh, weekends or the first uh, day of the week, then um, you may find that uh, the load and the amount of users that go to this website uh, changes radically uh, between different times of day or different times of the week. Uh, and of course, that influences performance as well. So let's now go into uh, the topic of measuring and improving performance. The first and one of the most important points in, in this presentation is that performance really isn't just something that you do once and then forget about it. It's not some sort of a, um, a checkbox that you tick off and then you're done with it. Uh, it's, it's a process that you need to be aware of and invest in uh, pretty much forever. Um, I, I drew it as a cycle uh, that begins with developing, then measuring, then optimizing, and then monitoring, um, and then, of course, developing some more. Uh, typically, uh, you always, once you're done developing a version, uh, um, then uh, um, typically there are additional features, there are uh, changes, there are improvements, there are fixes that you need to implement, and every time you then need to uh, measure again and optimize again, monitor again. 
Um, and of course, it's actually arguably this arrow here should be bidirectional uh, because typically after you measure, you find reasons to optimize, you find things that you can improve, and then probably you want to measure again and potentially optimize some more before you move it into production. Now, um, a very important uh, concept that I have to admit I'm also, I've uh, also been guilty of not always following is to set expectations <coughs> regarding performance. So, um, I assume that most of you in the audience are developers that uh, are responsible for delivering applications. It's, performance is probably something that you care about, but it's also important to understand from the business owner what the expectations are, if they have any. And if, by the way, they don't have any, maybe they should. Um, and the reason is that if there are no expectations, if you're not aiming for anything, then as, as, uh, as you can see here, uh, Typically, you're happy with where you are. Um, that it's, it's important to know what the expectations are, what you think, what the users expect to see in terms of uh, response time, uh, what are the expectations in terms of the amount of load that the system needs to be able to, uh, to take uh, so that you know when you uh, build the application, when you design it, when you benchmark it, whether the application fits the needs of uh, um, that was it was designed to do. So let's uh, now dive into the first step of the way: develop. Um, so performance during development. Uh, I want to actually begin with something which is really age old, which is the which are the three rules of code optimization. And those three rules are simply enough. The first one is simply enough: don't. In other words, don't optimize. Um, the second one is don't yet, as in don't optimize yet. And the third one is profile first. And let me now explain those rules and just slightly be a bit more verbose about them. The first rule essentially tells you not to optimize. It sounds extreme. Uh, I think it probably is to some degree too extreme, but it, to get, it's to, to get the point across. The second one is don't yet, which means the idea is don't prematurely optimize. Um, don't invest uh, time in squeezing every last bit of performance out of a given piece of code uh, unless you have a good reason to. And finally, uh, profile first, uh, the, the goal here is to um, make sure that those areas that you invest in optimization are actually the ones that are that are going to have an impact on uh, the overall application performance. Because if you're optimizing a part of the application that accounts for 2% of the overall execution time, chances are that even if you are miraculously able to completely eliminate that, that part altogether, still you're only going to see something like 2% performance gain. And in reality, chances are you're not going to be able to completely eliminate it, so the performance gain are going to be ne gains are going to be negligible. Now those are old, uh, and um, the, those two um, main um, two main rationale uh, behind those uh, those rules, uh, or maybe even three. The the first one is what I just said: uh, don't invest time and effort into things which may not um, um, impact the overall performance. So that's kind of the profile first. It's also related to the two other rules because sometimes if you, as you develop, you are investing in uh, performance optimization, uh, you have still you still don't have any idea how the overall application is going to perform, so uh, you, you don't yet even know uh, whether you are investing in a, uh, in a performance sensitive part of the app or not. Another rationale behind it is that um, optimized code tends to be more complex than non-optimized code, which is why, in general, it only makes sense to optimize parts of your code which are really performance sensitive. So again, um, the, those rules of code optimization tie to both prevent you from um, needlessly investing time in things which are not important, and also, arguably, create worse code, which may be 
marginally faster, but actually much more difficult to maintain. So <clears throat> that's the rationale behind uh, the, the thick uh, rules of code optimization. Those rules were written you know, many decades ago, and like I said, I think to some degree they're still relevant today. Um, even though today I think we have better tools, and even though you need to kind of keep those in the back of your mind and definitely keep the rationale for those in the back of your mind, I think in 2016 um, it actually does make sense to think about performance, to think and also act about, uh, about performance as you develop. And how do you do that? I think there are two main things that uh, you, should, you should be doing. One is performance. Um, that is not necessarily, or typically I would say, it's not about uh, optimizing uh, each and every small function or subroutine to run in the fastest possible way, but it is to, A, think about performance, <clears throat> Again, like I mentioned earlier, talk to the business owners, understand the expectations, and also architecturally think uh, at, at the high level, think about what is the right way of baking your components, of creating your data models so that you'll be able to use the right algorithms and have a high performance system. So again, there's a big difference between designing a system for high performance and kind of micro-optimizing a specific function to run in the fastest possible way. The first one is a lot more important than the second. And the second thing here, or the, the third bullet, is to pay attention to performance as you develop, and at the same time, don't optimize prematurely. So um, I, I'm going to, if we have time, I'm going to show, uh, to show you ZA, which is some sort of a live developer dashboard that, that shows you information about uh, your code as you are developing it, and it's kind of out of your way uh, when you don't need it, but available to you when you do. Um, if you see something, if you see some sort of a spike, if you see something that, it, that is consuming a lot of time, um, you, you may find, for instance, that you are using a table that doesn't have an index. In that case, that's a that's actually a great idea to fix it right away. Uh, don't wait for, uh, to be, for this to be fine during uh, staging or, or, or during QA. Um, on the flip side, again, if, uh, if you see a subroutine that is taking you know, 0.02 uh, seconds, or point, sorry, 0 0.02 milliseconds, even if you can optimize it, um, it's probably premature to do so unless at some point later on you see that this is a bottleneck and all likelihood something that consumes uh, 0.02 seconds is not going to be a, um, a bottleneck uh, pretty much in any application. In, a, in addition to ZA, which I'm going to show later, there are also kind of the more traditional ways to um, uh, profile and get an understanding of performance profiles during development. Of course, IDEs like PHP Storm uh, and, and Zen Studio provide you with um, uh, graphical profilers, show you where time is being spent. Of course, uh, this is typically something that you would do when you bump into a performance issue because it's a bit of a headache to use profilers, but it's, it definitely can be done. <clears throat> Code tasting is a feature that uh, is available in Zen Server and allows you to really see the entire execution flow of a given request, including uh, the performance breakdown. It also allows you to get a lot of insight into where time is being spent and where things can be optimized. And XHPOF, which is an, a powerful open source profiler that also can be used in development, can be used in production as well, like code tracing, um, but it can also be used in development to help you find uh, bottlenecks and understand where time is being spent in your system. That said, those tools, I would say that it makes more sense to use them only when you bump into an issue, uh, while ZA as a developer dashboard, that is something that makes it to use essentially all the time because it, actually, it can actually alert you to problems as you are developing um, and, and in many cases help you solve them before they become issues that you later need to solve with one of those tools. 
So going back to the sec to the second or going forward ever to the second uh, part of the flow measure. Um, like uh, many things in life, measurement me measuring performance uh, is often more difficult than people think. <clears throat> I've seen many benchmarks um, published on PHP, on PHP versus other things, on uh, different versions of PHP benchmarked against each other, um, and I, I, I've reviewed some of them, and I can say that in, in many, many situations, the benchmarks were just completely broken, and uh, they were just not representative of, of anything even remotely close to um, to, to real life. Now, even though people say uh, there's this uh, lies, damned lies and benchmarks, that's true. Benchmarks are not representative of real life, but still, uh, sometimes they can be completely off, and sometimes uh, they can be they, they can be close to reality. So, much like with other things in life, if it seems easy, if it seems too easy. In the case of measuring performance, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, and the reason is that it's really easy to get results. Uh, taking uh, some benchmarking software like AB or Siege or whatnot and pointing it at a, a URL on your website and uh, bombard it with requests and get some numbers back, that will pretty much always work. The question is whether those results are accurate or in any way representative of real world, uh, of real life, and in many cases they're not, unless you have a very good idea of what you're doing. The reason for that, that there's multiple reasons for that. The challenges essentially are that simulating real world workloads is not easy. Uh, usually, unless you have, unless your website is exclusively being accessed by some bored person that is just repeatedly hitting Control R again and again, refreshing the the same home page then bombarding the uh, website, the, the website homepage, or any page for that matter, with just uh, an endless flow of incoming requests is not representative of a real world situation by any stretch. Um, so that's one issue. A subset of those issues is that specifically if you don't do anything special, in many cases you're, bu you're likely to bump into blocking issues. Uh, this is something that personally, when I benchmarked PHP 7, or as it was called back then, PHP NG, versus HHVM, at some point, HHVM was something like 200 times faster than PHP NG, and back in the day, I can tell you that uh, it really sent some shivers down my spine, I was like, really depressed, what, what's going on, how come it's so much faster, and it ended up being uh, a bug with this, the difference in behavior between how HHVM handled locking for sessions versus how PHP uh, 7 and for that matter all versions of PHP handled locking for sessions. In a nutshell, HHVM did not lock at all. PHP uh, locked for the duration of the request. And essentially the benchmark that I ran, uh, even though I provided a concurrency level of 100 for the uh, um, benchmarking software, uh, effectively it was just, uh, it was simulating the same user with the same session, uh, and since there was uh, uh, there was session locking for the duration of the entire request, effectively there was just a concurrency of one, which is why PHP was performing really slowly in HHVM, which was not locking and was happily uh, co-opting the session data, uh, seemed to execute uh, um, 200 times faster. So locking issues uh, also things that you need to be aware of. You could have locks on file system uh, assets. You could have locking on sessions and on the database, on nearly on anything, um, which is why it's, again, important to try and simulate a real-world workload where you don't have just one user uh, uh, going to the same URL or even traversing the website, but you actually have simulate multiple users uh, traversing the website as would typically be the case in the real world. Hardware changes. This is something that is imp especially important if you want to uh, create uh, a, a performance profile over time um, and see how your app uh, changes its performance characteristics over the months and years. This is a good, generally a good idea, 
Uh, but in order to do that, you need to be running the benchmarks on the same hardware. Uh, ideally, on the same real hardware as opposed to virtual hardware or cloud-based instances. But if that's not an, not an option and you doing uh, you're only dealing with virtualized environments or cloud-based environments, then at least document and have a very good idea of um, what uh, um, what kind of virtual hardware you, you're using for the benchmark so that in the future you can repeat it as much as you can. Infrastructure fluctuations, uh, uh, including software, hardware, and network. Uh, let me give you an example for software fluctuation. Um, you could have a cron job running on your server at a given time. Uh, and for instance, on Linux every hour, it uh, re-indexes all of the files uh, on uh, the hard drive uh, to or at least updates the index uh, so that the, you can search for files on the file system very, very quickly. This is a very good idea, but if you happen to run your benchmark um, while this indexing is happening, suddenly uh, your results are going to be a lot slower, uh, even though obviously the application is not running slower uh, and hasn't changed at all. An example for hardware-based fluctuations is, uh, for instance, CPU, C modern CPUs, and for that matter, even not so modern CPUs, can change the clock speed uh, and go faster or slower depending on a variety of criteria, on the load, but also on things like heat. Um, and you may end up having the very same server behave differently depending on how hot the environment around, around it is uh, or whether um, the, um, the clock frequency scheduler decided to increase the frequency or decrease it for things that may, may not be in your control. Um, and all of those, of course, can affect the uh, results of your benchmarks. And last, uh, the uncertainty principle, which is not really for, from computer science, it's uh, from physics. And in a nutshell, and if there are any people in the audience that are familiar with it, you know that what I'm saying is not accurate, but it's kind of close enough. The uncertainty principle is, it means that you can't measure something without changing it. Um, and again, not accurate, not even close to exactly what it means, but kind of close enough in layman terms. Um, and the same, the same thing is true also uh, for, for benchmarks. And uh, even beyond uh, the change that you may inflict on your subject of, of, of benchmark, there are just sometimes things that you, that you or at least I cannot explain. Um, put differently, Try running the exact same benchmark uh, twice. In all likelihood, you're not going to get the exact same results. Okay? You may get something pretty close, but you're unlikely to get the exact uh, same results. Uh, you could easily get something which is plus minus five or even more percent from each other, even though you haven't changed anything. Uh, the systems that we deal with are very, very complex. Uh, think about how many moving parts, hardware, software, network, um, you know, all sorts of um, elements in the operating system that are happening, scheduled and unscheduled. Very complex systems that for practical purposes introduced uncertainty elements that we just cannot completely eliminate. So just uh, take into account that um, running one benchmark may not be enough, and actually I, I can even say one, running one benchmark is definitely not enough, and, and we're going to see ways to mitigate that later on. <clears throat> so after talking about some theory, let's talk uh, a bit more practically. How do we measure performance? So the common measurements in web applications are request per second, response time, and latency. The difference between response time and latency, response time is typically defined as the total amount of time it takes, to, it takes for, the, for the server to um, create the page. Uh, and latency is something like time to fail first byte, so how much time it actually takes the server to start uh, sending the, the, the page. Now, it is possible to have two different um, applications that, uh, that have the same output and even take the same amount of time to generate this output, but um, the one would have shorter latency than the other, as in it will start sending the results 
to the client faster. And in terms of the user experience, the one with uh, shorter latency is going to have a better user experience because as soon as um, information begins being sent to, to, the, to the browser, modern browsers, and that means browsers uh, for the last 10 or 15 years, are smart enough to start ending the page. So even if you don't have the whole thing, it's going to feel more responsive because you're going to see the, uh, the web page beginning to end. Uh, so that why, that's why latency is also quite important. In terms of pieces of software that you can use, there are really dozens, probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of those, but I put in here um, three very popular ones which are all open source that you can use. Siege uh, is uh, available uh, for pretty much all of in all of the Linux distributions, it's very simple to use. Apache Bench, which is commonly named, uh, commonly referred to as AB, um, is very simplistic. I would actually recommend Siege over it. Uh, no, no, not too many good reasons to use Apache Bench other than if you're really used to it for historical, uh, for historical reasons. And Apache JMeter, that, uh, as the name implies, it's implemented in Java. Uh, but you can really benchmark any sort of uh, web-based application with it, and uh, it's much more sophisticated, much more uh, advanced, and if you want to create uh, scenario-based testing, simulating different users, and something you know more advanced than just uh, bombarding a certain URL with, uh, uh, with uh, repeated requests, then JMeter is uh, probably a better solution to, than these two uh, alternatives. So, some tips about measuring performance. The most important one is to automate, and really I cannot overstate how important it is. Uh, some other bullets are going to relate to that, but if you benchmark, don't like performance, don't make this a one-off. Uh, create a skipped, create uh, uh, repeated automated ways to run the benchmark so that if you want to run it again in the future, it's not going to be a big headache and also you will be pretty confident that you're running the exact same thing uh, and you'll be able to compare, to compare results as opposed to, yeah, you know, I had something similar but this changed and that changed so I'm not sure uh, that the, the results are comparable. If you automate, you greatly increase your ability to compare results from previous benchmarks. Very much related is use repeatable hardware. Uh, repeatable hardware, I mean, something that uh, I'm not sure if uh, I invented this term, but um, hardware that uh, in the future when you want to uh, uh, repeat the same uh, benchmark, you'll be able to essentially recreate the very same environment. Like I mentioned before, ideally you should have dedicated hardware and not virtualized hardware, but at the very least, you should have, if, if you need to use a virtualized environment or cloud-based environment, you should have it thoroughly documented exactly what kind of instance you've been using. Uh, and if it's a virtualized environment, ideally uh, run it on the same, um, on the same uh, host hardware as you did the previous time. Don't move it from one server to another because that can greatly influence the performance characteristics. Um, the third bullet is to perform a warm-up. Um, pretty much any system, and definitely PHP-based system, performs very differently right after you, uh, you spin it up uh, compared to uh, later on uh, after the first few requests. <clears throat> the reasons for it, basically, file system caching kicks in, uh, so instead of uh, down to the disk to fetch the PHP files, uh, the operating system uh, caches those files itself, then there's opcode caching, potentially uh, page caching, data caching, I'm going to touch on all of, the, all of those uh, later in, in the webinar, um, but suffice to say that um, the first few, few requests, and by few I, I think, you know, can easily be the first thousand requests or so, are probably not representative of the real world performance of the, of the server. So the first few hundred or few thousand requests, you should uh, just kind of throw away and, and then you should perform the benchmark. The simplest way to do it is just to run the benchmark once and just throw those results away and after that, uh, chances are that the server is kind of warmed up 
and the performance is representative of its real world behavior. Look for cron drops. I mentioned this before. A cron drop can really uh, skew the results uh, if it happens at the same time as your benchmark. So either disable all the cron drops on the server or at least be aware of them so that uh, um, you don't run a, a benchmark while, uh, while a cron drop is also taking place. Try to simulate realistic scenarios. Again, uh, going back to the example I had when I benchmarked against HHVM, uh, I, I built something which was completely unrealistic, simulating one user going to a single URL again and again, and I bumped into a locking issue that, in reality, um, doesn't really um, have any sort of influence on performance, but on my benchmark, uh, it showed horrible performance. Um, use a separate load generating machine. Um, there, there are several reasons for it. First of all, um, uh, if you don't, if you use it on the same machine, then you are the, you're kind of farther away from a realistic scenario because in, in reality, <clears throat> the server would be uh, sending its information over the wire, and here it happens you know, within the box. So that's one issue, but the bigger issue is that the load generators themselves consume uh, resources, they consume memory, they consume CPU time, and they actually therefore affect the performance of uh, the subject that you're trying to test, the web server. So um, uh, it's, it's ideal, ideally you should really be using a separate machine for uh, generating loads, and those machines, or machine or machines, uh, if you do use them, uh, you, if you do use separate machines, those machines should also have repeatable hardware, <clears throat> because the, for the very same reasons, you, you could, uh, if you run um, uh, a benchmark from uh, from a certain uh, for a slow machine, uh, it could be that the slow machine that is running the the load generator is the bottleneck. So. Uh, in, in this case, if you want to get a comparable um, benchmark in the future, that machine should also uh, be the same as in the previous benchmark, not just the subject machine that you're testing, but also the load generator machine as well. <clears throat> Have expectations and validate them. That goes back to the beginning. Having expectations is important. Um, and that also helps uh, to understand whether the benchmark results are um, kind of completely off. Like for instance, when I benchmark PHP uh, versus HHVM, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe if I didn't have HHVM to compare to, I would have expect, I, I would have said that the, you know, five requests per second that I received uh, in the benchmark, maybe it made sense. But if I actually looked at what kind of benchmark it was, it actually doesn't make sense that it would be so slow. If I, um, if I actually did this, ex this thinking experiment and uh, thought to myself, how many requests per second do I expect to have uh, to get out of this on PHP, it, it would, be, would have been at least several dozen requests per second. And as soon as I uh, uh, got the result of five requests per second, I would have known, hey, something is broken in the benchmark, not in the app itself. The simple uh, reality is that there's no uh, magic way to uh, go around the uncertainty principle. So once you've done all the things, all these other bullets here, still conduct each individual benchmark at least three times and take an average. And if one of those uh, runs has radically different performance, you can usually, from the other two, you can usually assume that this is uh, some sort of maybe a crunch of something that you missed. Maybe the moon and the sun aligned the wrong way. I don't know, but don't worry about it too much. Just turn the uh, benchmark uh, a couple of times more and take the average. Of course, if you do see kind of repeated fluctuations, you could have some issue in the app where, you know, under some circumstances, it could perform very slowly, and this is something that you would have to uh, uh, research and get to the bottom of. Perform, perform the benchmarks often. Um, it, it's, it's typically not a good idea to run them just every uh, every few months or every year, because then it's very difficult to tell what changed and what uh, what is the source of the performance degradation. By the way, also if you see better performance, 
it's more difficult to understand what you what you got it from you know, because you know sometimes uh, positive feedback is quite important. Maybe you could do more of whatever it is uh, you did that points. Um, so performing it often, ideally, as a part of your continuous delivery or continuous integration process, uh, that's ideal. And last, going back to the beginning, automate. Um, automate everything that you can so that the um, uh, benchmarks are repeatable. Which brings us to how you can actually improve performance. Now that you've measured it, uh, of course, you measure it and you're happy and you're uh, uh, that, and, and you are uh, within the results that the, or the expectations that the business owner defined for you, assuming they did. Um, but maybe you're not, or maybe you think that there are opportunities to make it go faster, and maybe you can shave a second from uh, uh, the response time and increase your conversion rates by 7%. So the, there are a lot of different ways that you can use, a lot of different strategies that you can use to improve the performance of PHP based applications, um, and I, I'm going to touch on a few in the next few slides. So here we're seeing kind of a very high-level diagram of what a PHP-based web server looks like. Uh, there's the uh, web server here at the bottom, could be Apache or Nginx or uh, you know, IIS or whatever it is you're using. The PHP um, language is lying on top of it. You could have app server services, like if you run Xen servers, all sorts of plugins into PHP. On top of that, typically you would have frameworks or other components. And on top of that, you would have your app, uh, your custom code, or maybe an off-the-shelf app like WordPress or Joomla um, that is running on top of the framework. And of course, uh, maybe it's running directly on top of PHP. Now, in reality, you'd probably have several of those running uh, alongside each other, um, at least in production. <clears throat> Likely to have a cluster of those, potentially a cluster that changes and scales up and down as, as needed. <clears throat> and um, typically, it would be behind the load balancer. The end user goes to web the website, goes to the load balancer. The request is final to one of the servers in the cluster. And in turn, typically your app, unless it's a simple hello world application, it typically uh, communicates with some sort of uh, data, pro data provider or data providers like databases or service backends. Now, the simplest way to uh, improve performance, which works in many situations, is those three dots here. Scale. Just throw more hardware at it. Uh, in, we're in the cloud age, so throwing more hardware at it, uh, or in this case, throwing more virtual hardware at it, is pretty simple. Um, assuming that your app is built in a scalable way, you can relatively easily add um, more servers to it, uh, and ideally, if all goes well and you don't have any special bottlenecks in your app, then um, the, the overall performance of the cluster would go linearly uh, along uh, with the servers that you have. Of course, there's one fairly big gotcha uh, here that costs a lot of money. Uh, even more so if you uh, have to call IT and have them provision a physical, uh, a physical machine uh, for you or even a virtual machine for you. But even if you're uh, kind of out and about and happy with the cloud, still adding cloud instances can be quite costly. Which is why uh, we try to come up with ways to squeeze better performance out of the same hardware, out of the same out of servers, without throwing more hardware at the problem. So now, what I want to do is to dive into several different strategies to do exactly that. And the first one um, is actually right at the PHP level itself. Right at the PHP interpreter level, if you will. So zooming into the, uh, PHP, this is what it looks like under the hood. Uh, this is a 15, <coughs> sorry, this is a 15-year-old uh, diagram. Uh, so uh, excuse the colors. I'm sure that back in the day it was kind of the best hip colors 
uh, to get the point across. Today they look a bit uh, uh, extreme, but it's still surprisingly it's still pretty much uh, accurate even um, uh, 15 or 16 years after I created it for PHP 4 uh, in terms of the major blocks. Um, we have the in blue what we're seeing here is the Zen engine. Uh, the Zen engine is the component that is responsible for executing the business logic of your uh, of your code. It, it actually takes in the code, the, the source code reads it, translates it into an in-memory presentation, and executes it. And it does so while communicated with extension models like MySQL, LDAP, and and so on. Also communicating with other uh, some other services that exist in PHP. Um, and finally, these through the server API, communicate with the web server to eventually send the response, well, actually initially obtain the input from the user and eventually sending the response back to the user. And like I mentioned, for the most part, this hasn't changed in the last 15 uh, or 16 years since we introduced the Zend engine. Um, in order to understand the first component, you need to uh, understand um, that part of uh, the execution. When PHP tries to execute uh, a file, uh, one of your PHP files, it, as I mentioned, it first um, compiles it using this component, the runtime compiler. It first compiles it into an in-memory presentation um, that is essentially one-to-one -one mapping of the file, but in a way that is easier for computers to digest. And then it passes it on to the executor, which iterates over this uh, in-memory presentation, which we call intermediate code, and, uh, well, executes it uh, commu while communicating with the extension models and eventually funneling the output back to the web server. Now, if you, are, have, if you have a typical web application, then chances are you're running the same PHP file multiple times, uh, typically many times, thousands, even hundreds of thousands, or even millions of times. And since I mentioned that the intermediate code is essentially a one-to-one -one representation of the source code, the whole uh, compilation process is kind of redundant. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just do it once and then uh, reuse the intermediate code again and again? So opcode caching uh, does exactly that. The Zend opcache plugs into uh, both before and after the Anto compiler, and when PHP needs to process a file, it first checks, or the Zen opcache first checks, whether this file has been seen before. If it has, it fetches the intermediate code from memory instead of compiling it. If it hasn't, then it first compiles it and stores it for future use. And that effectively pretty much eliminates the overhead of the runtime compiler altogether. Using opcode caching has pretty much just uh, advantages. There are really no good ways not to do it. Not to do it. It's turnkey. It doesn't require any changes to your code. You can just flip it on, and the same code unmodified will run faster. It results in very substantial performance gains. Uh, typically, at least two x can be a lot more in framework-based applications. Uh, it could be, you know, even three or four or five x uh, faster performance. It's tightly integrated in PHP. In 2013, we contributed uh, the Zen Opcache to the community, and it's now integrated into PHP. Um, so there isn't a situation where you know the latest version of PHP isn't yet supported by Opcache. It's our responsibility as we produce a new version of PHP to also, at the very same time, uh, make sure that Opcache is, uh, is uh, compatible with it. And it has very, very modest requirements. It typically, in most cases, most apps require only a few uh, tens of megabytes or at most a few hundreds of megabytes server-wide to completely cache all of, the, uh, all of the code of your applications, which in 2016 terms is really not a lot, just a few hundred megabytes uh, to, you know, to uh, cache the entire server. It's really nothing. So the verdict is clearly always use it. Chances are you already do, but make sure that you do. Still at the PHPM, uh, a bit more far-reaching is PHP 7. 
Um, you can also gain quite a lot of uh, uh, performance by migrating from PHP 5, or God forbid if you're still on 4, uh, to PHP 7, and performance is going to shoot through the roof. Um, typical gains we're seeing are at the 2x range, um, and uh, those uh, these are newer applications, as you can probably tell. We talk about framework-based applications, we're talking about the shelf applications like WordPress or Magento or Drupal, um, and you can see that pretty much across the board, it's between, uh, it, it's roughly 2x, um, and just by updating your PHP version, being able to um, essentially have your, uh, your server infrastructure uh, potentially flip off half of your servers, this is big. Uh, it's almost unprecedented uh, in, in PHP's history, definitely in modern history, if, if we kind of factor out the first few version, versions of PHP, which were just uh, dog slow, uh, since PHP became essentially the king of the web, this is completely unprecedented, uh, being able to, again, just upgrade to a newer version, Relatively minor investment in terms of the headache involved in, in migrating from 5 to 7, um, and, and you get 2x performance, this is great. Uh, and, and even typically you see, uh, uh, even after you reduce your server infrastructure by half, typically you still see that uh, the servers, the, the remaining servers, are not as loaded as, uh, as the servers used to be when PHP 5 was running on them. Um, on that, by the way, if you are interested in moving from 5 to 7, but you're kind of unconfident uh, or, or kind of a bit worried about what this entails, we can help. Uh, we have migration services, people that are very uh, experienced uh, in, um, uh, in migrating PHP 5 to 7 apps, and uh, this is something we can definitely help you with. Um, this explains where the gains came from. I'm not going to dive into it, but suffice to say that we managed to make the um, memory requirements of uh, PHP 7 substantially lower. And as I mentioned before, uh, if your uh, application consumes less memory, it's going to be faster, and we did this in a very serious way in PHP 7. On that, maybe in another webinar. Web server. The web server itself and its configuration can also affect performance quite a bit. Different web servers behave differently in terms of performance. So, uh, for instance, Nginx versus Apache. Nginx is typically faster uh, without hurting anyone's feelings. Um, but even if you're using Apache and you don't want to move to Nginx because you, experience, you have experience uh, with Apache, uh, still, you should look into things like potentially moving to FPM instead of mod PHP. Mod PHP is historically the is historic way of running PHP on top of Apache, but FPM um, is is a, the the way that Nginx uses, and you can use the same strategy on, on Apache and get uh, similar gains under Apache as you can from Nginx. Concurrency settings, another thing you, you can pay attention to. Uh, or you should pay attention to, you sh it shouldn't be too low, your web server shouldn't be set to too low concurrency, uh, so that it will not be able to handle the uh, incoming traffic, but also it shouldn't ha have its concurrency settings too high, which would you know, cause it to exhaust the resources of the physical server uh, and, and potentially slow down to a halt. Another thing to to pay attention to is keep alive the uh, advantages to uh, flipping it on or off. This is something you should read about. Common wisdom is typically to turn it off, uh, but you should read about its uh, implications and then decide for yourself whether you want to keep it on or off depending on your app. Next um, is uh, the layer in between your application code and data services, uh, databases, service backends, or even file system. And here you can use a strategy called data caching. Data caching saves expensive operations, like the ones I mentioned, database queries, API calls, and so on, uh, by caching the results. Um, 
the advantages are, are huge. It essentially eliminates the time of costly calls, essentially pushes them all the way down to zero. And it also has the benefit of reducing the load on your uh, data providers, like your uh, database service provider and file system. The disadvantages are that it does require code modification. You need to actually change your application in order to implement, uh, to implement data caching. And it also makes sense, it, so it only makes sense if um, the results of those uh, database queries or uh, API calls don't change for relatively long periods of time. And for the sake of this, uh, for the sake of that, long periods of time could be uh, anything more than 10 seconds. This is a ballpark figure on some very high traffic sites, even one second can be enough. Uh, but in most cases, it makes sense to only catch it if, it's, uh, if, if the data stays uh, correct for at least 10 seconds. So data caching, highly recommended. A lot of, I, I've bumped into a lot of situations where it made a lot of sense and people had no idea that this is something that they can do and it can really greatly influence performance. Next thing is full page caching and that uh, is essentially a layer in between the web server and PHP. And like data caching, it caches the results, but instead of caching the results of uh, uh, database query, it caches the results of the entire page, the, or, or the body, or not just the body, essentially all of the output of a given page. The advantage is that if you can use it, page execution time, the whole page execution time is essentially trimmed down completely to zero, uh, and, and we pretty much save the need to go into PHP at all. So indirectly, it also saves all of the memory and resources uh, that uh, otherwise this uh, request would have needed to use. The disadvantages are that it's suitable only for specific use cases, like for instance in um, content management systems, uh, you may have pages that for prolonged periods of time, again, could be 10 seconds or a minute, don't change, and then you can use full page caching. Uh, but of course, to a lot of other, in a lot of other situations, uh, full page caching uh, cannot be uh, cannot be uh, used, um, and instead you should be looking into partial page caching or data caching. The other disadvantage is that it requires configuration, but that's uh, typically not very complicated. The verdict for page caching is this is by far the best performance booster uh, because essentially it doesn't matter how slow your application is, if you can use it, it's going to be blazing fast. So you should use it whenever possible. Now, we've been talking about performance, and this is the definition that I talked about earlier. There's something which is not quite performance, but kind of in the same, you can, maybe it's uh, the cousin of performance is perceived performance. And what is perceived performance? Simply enough, it's how quickly software, software appears to be doing its job. And since we're human and we're not robots, uh, Appearance has plays a major role. So the things that you that we can do uh, inside our app to make it seem go faster and improve the uh, overall satisfaction of the end user, even though we're not actually saving any cycles, any any computer time. So um, the way to there are several uh, uh, ways to do it. I'm going to focus. Well, what, one way you're probably all familiar with Ajax the whole transition to single page applications. This makes us feel as if things are faster. To be honest, in many cases, they are actually faster, but a major, uh, but another major advantage of Ajax is it, it makes it also seem faster. We are not staying at a blank page as the browser um, reloads uh, information. Uh, we're actually seeing something which is kind of like a desktop application that is fetching information and it seems to be substantially faster than uh, it really is. What I want to talk about now is asynchronous processing. So, for instance, if you've ever ordered something on Amazon, um, you probably notice that as soon as you hit, uh, as soon as you submit your order, it tells you, thank you, your order has been submitted. Um, but if you've ever had a situation where your credit card, uh, there was a problem with it, uh, you, you would actually notice that it would still happily take your order, but then after a minute or so, 
you would get uh, a message from Amazon saying that you, there was a problem clearing the, your credit card. So perception-wise, this was really fast. And instead of actually clearing the credit card as you submit the order and only afterwards telling you thank you, they first tell you everything is fine, your order has been placed, everything is good, and then they actually try to process the order uh, and they do so asynchronously. And this is a gate strategy uh, for certain use cases, things like PDF generation, sending email, credit card clearance, and so several other use cases. And uh, you can really um, improve the overall satisfaction of the end user, save him the need of waiting for uh, for the uh, request for, for the process to actually finish, uh, and make the application seem faster. Even though, in terms of actual cycles, you didn't save anything. Arguably, you actually made it uh, made it consume a, a few more cycles. But to the end user, still the, the experience is significantly better. Another advantage of asynchronous processing is being able uh, to um, funnel the load of this particular task, like again, PDF generation or credit card clearance, to separate servers so that your web servers don't uh, need to um, uh, do this job and you can assign this particular job to separate servers. The disadvantages, like, uh, like uh, uh, data caching, it requires code changes. You actually need to think about which uh, portions of your uh, app can be uh, performed asynchronously and modify your app accordingly. And it's really only suitable for specific use cases like the one I mentioned. There are others, but it's not really something that you can use, for instance, to render different parts of the page. Uh, it, it, this is just not suitable for that. Monitor, getting to the last component in, in the performance cycle, monitoring is really important because uh, it's great that you benchmark, it's great that you optimize, but when the other meets the road and actual real world users start using your application, typically things change uh, and the, they, they, they're not, uh, they don't behave exactly like they did in the lab. Um, and monitoring the uh, production website enables you to have an idea of uh, uh, what's the actual situation. It also enables uh, you as developers or as ops to provide an SLA to the business owners and you know, give them the uh, comfort that things are, be, uh, are performing the way they should. It also gives, puts the finger on your pulse so that you don't have uh, to wait for uh, users to report performance issues, which goes to the fourth bullet. Um, in many situations, uh, users that bump into a problem, whether it's a bug in, on a website or performance issue, they think that the, the company, the website owner, is aware and is working on the clock to fix it. When in reality, in many situations, they may not be even aware that there's a problem to begin with. Uh, and, and also, people today have a very short time span and are very impatient in general. Uh, and if they bump into a performance problem, and you know maybe they'll try once or twice more, but that's it. They're going to go somewhere else. So having a finger on the pulse and finding performance issues as soon as they occur, thanks to monitoring, <clears throat> can enable you both to find issues that are otherwise wouldn't be important, you will not be aware of, but also find about them as early as possible uh, so that you can fix them and keep your users happy uh, instead of having them go away to someplace else. Um, recapping, um, I, I think that I probably don't have time to uh, do some, uh, to do a demo, so I, maybe I'm going to, uh, actually before the recap, I will just maybe talk quickly about the different things that uh, I wanted to demo. So one would be ZA. As I mentioned, it's a, a developer's dashboard. I would even go as far as saying it's the developer's best friend uh, that you can use to pay attention to performance as you're developing uh, in a very non-intrusive way. Um, I highly recommend that you take a look at it. You can either evaluate it as a part of Zen Server or download uh, a preview that we have for ZA standalone that you can plug into your existing 
PHP infrastructure on Linux. Um, secondly, data cache and page cache, those two are also available uh, in a data cache. We have APIs for those in Zen Server. Page cache, we have a UI for you to easily uh, enable page caching on your app. And uh, finally, job queue allows you to uh, perform a synchronous processing, which I mentioned a couple of slides ago, without having to go through the headache of implementing it on your own and uh, by using uh, a programmatic PHP API to schedule jobs. It's very, very nice and powerful. So I highly uh, recommend that you take a look at it as well. So to recap, performance is important to your business. Um, it translates into money. It, trans uh, it translates into user satisfaction, which in turn also translates to money. Um, so definitely something you should pay attention to. It's a cycle, not a one-off investment. Uh, it's not something that you can invest now one or two months and a week or whatever and say, okay, now I'm performance enabled. It doesn't work this way. You need to uh, continuously invest in it. And again, the best way to do it is to bake it into your development workflow. Setting expectations with yourself and your business owner is very, very important um, to, well, to know if you're meeting them. And tools can greatly help, especially if they're baked into your development cycle. And finally, performance you care about, you absolutely use PHP 7, you must, as you're the uh, I'm sure we'll say in the next uh, episode of Star Wars. Thank you all, and um, I'll be happy to hear from you, or maybe go all the way back to the first slide. I'm, uh, I'll be happy to hear from you over email or on Twitter uh, for feedback or questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Bev. That was a very good overview of what performance is, uh, how to measure it, and uh, how to get better at it. Uh, we hope we answered all of your questions during the webinar, and if not, we will post a blog shortly to provide any answers that we didn't get to and include um, uh, some more resources and information for you to follow up with. As well, we will send an email out to all attendees uh, with more resources.